Pelican shot 54%, scored 54 points, and lead the Grizzlies 54 to 50. Ten of those points coming from Julius Randle as the Pels play without Anthony Davis, but lead it by four. Part of an 11 game MLK Day around the NBA, and it's the American Express halftime reporter, Ernie Johnson, Shaquille O'Neal, Charles Barkley, Kenny the Jet Smith, and our special guest here for our halftime report is Adam Silver, the commissioner of the NBA. It's good to see you, as always. Thanks for having me. Let me, let me join in with that. Okay. Um, <laughs> what does this day mean for you? What, what feeling do you get? And I know you were in the, uh, the arena in Atlanta today to watch some magic in the Hawks, but uh, the way the league embraces this day? Uh, it's always been a special day, as you guys know. In the NBA, we have 11 games today. But not just that. All 30 teams activate around MLK Day in their communities. We have everything from clinics to tournaments to essay contests, museum visits social activities around junior NBA in the communities. And, and, you know, I think what Dr. King's message embodies, I think, so much of what this league is about. And I, I, I always love that through line. You and I have talked about, about this in the past, that Bill Russell stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in August 1963 when that very I Have a Dream speech was delivered. And it's wonderful to walk out. You know, as you said, I was over at the State Farm Arena for the Hawks game to see the players on their shooting shirts. Mm. You know, and it says dream on the front, and then the back of the shirts have the first few lines from the actual speech. Yeah. And how important has it been for you uh, as you look at uh, players being socially aware, players not being afraid to speak out, and continuing that thread from Bill Russell? I, I think it's critically important. And, and what I always point out is that began long before me. It was part of these guys' generation when they were on the floor. It was part of Bill Russell. It was part of Bob Cousy. It was part of even players that came before them. And I think even more so in now with all that's going on in our country and globally, with 25% of our players coming from outside the United States, I always feel it's part of Americana that we export to the world. Those uniquely American values, that First Amendment, that freedom of speech. And I think it's, I'm thrilled at the fact that players in this league are comfortable speaking out on issues that are important to them. And, and as I say, I think, and these guys know, it, it's not for everyone. Yeah. You know, it's, it's for those players. I'm not saying you should be speaking on political matters if you're not comfortable doing that. But if you are, and by the way, I also think it's great that they engage on all kinds of activities in society. They talk about music. They talk about fashion. I mean, they have this platform to show people they're truly multidimensional. They're not just ball players. You know, Commissioner, you look at the last uh, election, see how many women were elected to Congress. The NBA's made some inroads as far as hires, hiring women. When do you think Kamala Harris announcing today? Is she yes, yes. The um, Remember, she was at our All-Star game in L.A. speaking. Yeah. Yep. Remember when I was asking a question? Well, you can finish it. Okay. We just, we just have a, just a moment. <laughs> I apologize. You, you know, we see a lot of NBA teams hiring women. Obviously, uh, Becky down in San Antonio. When do you think we're going to get to the point where we have a woman who actually in control of a team as a general manager or a coach? Well, I begin. We actually have two women who have control of a team right now. You have Gail Benson in New Orleans, and you, you, of course, have Jeannie Buss in Los Angeles. So you actually have two women who have full control over yeah. franchises. I think, to your point, in terms of general managers, it's happening, and it's going to be uh, an evolution, or it, it will continue to evolve in this league. You have more and more women, as you guys have pointed out, working in front offices in the league. And I think it's an area where as much credit as we get for being ahead in certain areas, I'll, I acknowledge we're behind. I mean, in positions, whether it's refereeing, whether it's coaching, whether it's being a general manager, there's absolutely no reason why we shouldn't have more women in those jobs. I think it's been part of the history of Major League Sports, and we were allowed, I think, to, on one hand, do incredible things in communities and, and, and show, represent those principles that Dr. King talked about. But then when it came to women in front office positions, somehow it just wasn't part of the culture of that league. And I think that's something we're all working to change very quickly. I don't have a question, but I would like to take this time to, to commend you. You know, we all played under uh, the great David Stern. I know he was your mentor for many years, but ever since you have taken control of the ship, you've always done the right thing, whether it comes socially or politically. So I just want to take this time to personally say thank you for doing a wonderful job and, you know, letting the players be who they are rather than, you know, having control. You're doing a great job. I, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I'll echo that. Thank you. Thank you for saying yeah, that. Yeah, I'll echo that and kind of piggyback off of that because mine is more of a commentary as well as a, <coughs> a, a, a question that you could kind of fill in on. I just always felt that on Mount Luther King Day, we talk about civil rights being, you know, in the 60s, it was really about the simplicities, civil rights. 
simple things of, that mattered. You know, not being judged by the color of your skin. Simple, simple thought process that was not simple. Then we, I, I think we moved into a complexity of like being business and business owners. And then realizing now that we are back to the simplicities about civil rights, about police brutality, possibly, and all of the things that go on now. And, and as a league, how are we embracing the simplicities and how are we embracing the complexities because they're happening at the same time? It's, it's a great point. And I think and, and first principles mm -hmm. go to human rights. And I think that's something we're increasingly talking about in this league. And whether it's African Americans, whether it's women, whether it's the LGBT community, uh, you know, that, that we focused on in North Carolina, I think it's, again, it, when you look back at the values that were created around from the early days of this league, again, from Bill Russell standing there with Dr. King, I think that those values, you know, while they're simple principles, in real life they are complex. And I realize that we live in a divided society, and by no means, I think, as a league, should we be necessarily lecturing people. We have to listen to other people's points of views. I think that's important. And look for opportunities to bring people together. I mean, one of the things that the Hawks right down the street talk about is building bridges through basketball. And I think, I, I, I think it's very important that while we, we point out when we see injustice, that, again, it's not the league saying, necessarily that we're here to lecture you and tell you the right way to do things. I do think we have to listen and, again, find commonality through sports. That's what's so incredible. I mean, all of us travel the world with this game. You guys, and you know, we've been, I just got back from Europe last week. I was in Africa over the summer. I was in China in October. And these are universal human values. And, and what's so special about sports, and I think maybe was, is unique to basketball because we're a global sport, we can use this as a platform to bring people together. It won't take a break, but we're not taking a break. So listen, are you concerned about the poaching aspect of the NBA with the super teams now? The chat has already started uh, on Kawhi Leonard, where he's going next year from a small market. You got Anthony Davis, same situation. It's going to start next year with Giannis. Are you concerned about the big picture of that in the NBA, just having one or two super teams, and we're just going to keep poaching superstars from smaller markets? I'm, I'm absolutely concerned. I think then the issue is how can we address it? I mean, we, as a policy matter, when players are talking to players, and you guys can speak to this, I think it would be pointless to try to police what one um, player is saying to another. I, I think players are going to have their own conversations. And the reason a different rule applies to players and teams is that players don't have control. The teams do. Um, on the other hand, that if we thought that teams were working in unison with players to try to recruit players, other players, that would be a problem. But in the day and age of social media, I recognize part of the appeal of this league is that it's 24-7, that people love the chatter, they love the narratives around teams, they love the narratives around players moving, and it's part of this community, that people are endlessly going to talk about those things. I think what's most important, I think we're also seeing in the league, despite that kind of chatter, that, that there's, there's been an equalization among franchises in that it doesn't really matter what market you're in anymore, that you can be a global star, whether you're in Oklahoma City or whether you're in Los Angeles or whether you're in Indiana. What's, what matters is how the team performs. So I, I think that counters that narrative to a certain extent. And there may be things we have to look at when we sit down with the players again, because the players all want to be in a league where everybody has an opportunity to win too. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I am concerned, but I think it's something that we can solve, but we got to continue to talk about. It. Commissioner, we would love to have you back another time where we can have even more time to talk about things on the floor. But uh, thank you very much for joining us on this. Thanks, Ernie. Podcast. Thanks, all of you. Yes, well, thank day you. With the Ernie Johnson in Atlanta. Our MLK Day triple header continuing with Game 2 featuring James Harden and the Rockets taking on Joel Embiid and the Philadelphia 76ers. That's a warrior right there. <laughs> How do you know? He told me <laughs> last week. Yep. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Welcome uh, inside Studio J. Ernie Johnson, Charles Barkley, Kenny the Jet Smith, and Shaquille O'Neal. 11 games, 22 of the 30 teams in the league playing on this uh, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. Glad you're spending part of it with us. Uh, let's let's kind of take a look around some of the games that have all already happened. Just real quick looks. What do you say? 
Just call Paul, walking the Paul George, no. Paul George, 31. Paul George is having a fantastic season. Yeah, they beat the Knicks 127-109. Everybody beats the Knicks, Ernie. First win of the calendar year for the Chicago oh, Bulls. They beat, count, the Cavs. they beat the Cavaliers. Yeah, that doesn't count. It doesn't count, Ernie. This doesn't count as a real win. Yeah, a win is a win. Leave them alone. Otto Porter and the Wizards have won seven of their last ten. They beat Detroit 101 to 87. Yeah, shout out to my boy Scott Brooks doing a fantastic job with the injuries. Down Town Atlanta, Niko Vukcevic. And the Magic snap a five game road losing streak. How about the Greek freak? 31 points, 15 rebounds. Oh, I know what this is. Oh, my, oh, my God. I know what that is. That is, that guy. Get out your way. Yeah, oh, what that is. So just smile. His 19th game of at least 30 and his 14th of at least 15 rebounds. And how about D'Angelo Russell? Oh, All right, this guy has played great. 31 yeah. points, his his eighth 30-point game this season. He had seven in the first three seasons of his NBA career well, combined. Real good. Well, he was busy snitching. <laughs> <laughs> but they beat, Sacra they beat Sacramento tonight. Youth. He you was know, a you, double agent. You no, know, but you talk about youth. You talk about that. But just it's youth in general. I think overall, you know, guys get given up on a little early because they're coming into the league early. So that, that potential that they might meet is finally starting to come around because – Here's a guy who obviously can shoot the three, but, you know, he was also a great passer. Even when he was with the Lakers, he was a great passer. Um, but I, I think overall now he's just understanding where you get your points from in any NBA basketball game. That's he, it. Might, he might be an all-star. Well, I yeah, think he might it. be an all-star. Well, he's not going I'm before. I, I, I would he's take their, Dinwiddie. He's, their, Dinwiddie. Leading, he's yeah. their leading scorer. But Dinwiddie to me is how – like, he's played fantastic. Don't get me wrong. But if I had to take a net – and Coach Atkinson, is that his name, Ernie? Yes, it is. Atkinson, he's yes. done a fantastic job. Sean Marks, they're doing a fantastic job in Brooklyn. Other than the Denver Nuggets, I, I thought I knew, I knew Denver was going to be good. I think the Brooklyn Nets are the most surprised team in the NBA. I yeah, he is playing with a lot of confidence. You know, I thought in LA it'd be times where he was confident and he wasn't confident if he had a bad game. But uh, to add on to what you guys saying, he's definitely playing great ball. Hey, I have a little question for you. In that Dallas loss to Milwaukee tonight, Luka Doncic had a triple double at 19. Only one other teenager has had a triple double in NBA history. Who was it? Markel Fultz. Kevin Garnett. Who said Markel Fultz? Me. He knew. He heard it. No, oh. I knew it, though. He knew it. How about that? Because it's from yeah. Philly. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Goodbye, yeah, you goodbye, Don Chick. Kevin uh, Garnett, no other triple double? No. No. Not as a teenager. Hey, you hear me, kid? What's that? Said, goodbye, Don Chick. Oh, he gets straight at <laughs> You get a triple double, you disappear. <laughs> well, well, we're about to see Philadelphia play Houston. All right, so the Rockets come in 26 and 19. Philadelphia is 30 and 17. James Harden on this just ridiculous roll. 19 straight games of at least 30 points. He's had at least 40 and 10 out of 13. The last three games, he's averaged 54 points, shooting 48% <laughs> and 36 He won't get that tonight. Three. What, because you keep telling me, look, you got to get the ball out of his hands. Defensively, yeah. if you're Philadelphia, Charles, what's the blueprint? What do you do now? You say, okay, here's how we're going to defend James Harden and hold him down. Well, the Philly got two guys who I think can guard him. I think James Harden can go, uh, not excuse me, I think that. Yeah, James Harden can guard him. I so. think Jimmy Butler can guard him, and I think Ben Simmons can guard him. I think you've got to force him right. And, and I was thinking about this today. That little step back thing, you just have to live with that. You just, like, like a couple games ago, he went two for 19. You can't stop that. Force him right and make him pass the ball. But Philly got two guys. His shot to me is like Kareem Skyhook. The most unguardable shot ever is Kareem Skyhook. That little triple uh, high jump travel thing James does, it's unguardable. We're told, by the way, Jimmy Butler, a no-go tonight. No-go? Whoa, he got a hard so, flu. So now what you're going to do? Well, difficult. You know, I, I think overall, though, when you have a shot blocker, that does help as well because when he does drive, it does make him a passer. Um, and I there's think no you Capello to, either. I think you have to make him one or the other. I can't. I don't think you can let him see the floor and be a scorer. Um, the James Harden, you know, like you said, the step back is is is, is difficult to guard. Uh, you know, but in, for me, double teaming him I, to get the ball James, out. Of James, James, is, James is in the same category as a Barkley, Malone, Jordan, Kobe. Then. Not going to stop him. Not going to stop him shutting down. So what I would do is I'd let him get his, shut everybody else down. What makes the Rockets dangerous is when he's going for 30 for 40 and you got other guys shooting threes. Let him do what he's going to yeah. do because he's going to do it anyway but, but the, and you shut everybody but else But the down. problem is, Shaq, if he starts making threes, you're in for a dogfight. Me and Kid have been talking for the last, last year and a half. 
I'm taking the ball out of James Harden's hand. I'm double him and seeking those other guys make a play. That's I'm it. not going to let James Harden get That's 30 it. and get 40 or 50. No, he's getting 50 three. now. I'm I know what I'm saying. <laughs> he's going to get at least 30 Listen, anyway. But he's, he's making those threes. Yeah, Double it. team James Harden. Don't, That's don't, it. don't let the others get involved. Kevin Harlan, Reggie Miller, Allie LaForce on the scene. Got you covered.